today. Bitcoin rises again, crossing the $31,000 mark to end the week. JP Morgan is expanding its blockchain-based payment rail to include Euro payment transactions. And Coindesk's Michael Casey breaks down crypto's biggest challenges in 2023. Welcome to CNBC's Crypto World, I'm Tanea McKeel. Crypto prices continue to rally to end the week. As of noon Eastern, Bitcoin climbed above the $31,000 level at one point hitting its highest level in more than a year. Ether crossed the $1,900 level and Solana rose slightly, trading at nearly $17. Bitcoin and Ether are on pace for a winning week, building on gains driven by institutional interest in the future of crypto. Okay, let's take a look at what's making headlines. Today, the U.S. Supreme Court backed Coinbase's bid to halt customer lawsuits. This comes as Coinbase pursues appeals aimed at moving the disputes out of courts and into private arbitration. Companies usually prefer to arbitrate claims because the process is cheaper and faster than litigation in court. In a 5-4 to four decision, the justices overturned a lower court's ruling involving a user who sued after a scammer stole money from his account. The lower court had let a proposed class action lawsuit proceed while Coinbase pressed its appeal arguing that the claims belong in arbitration. The justices dismissed a second case that Coinbase had asked it to review. Next, Alameda Research, the crypto hedge fund associated with the now bankrupt exchange FTX, is seeking the return of hundreds of millions of dollars founder Sam Bakeman fried appears to have paid for access to celebrities and politicians. On Thursday, FTX sued a former aide to Hillary Clinton and his investment firm, K5, as well as others, seeking to claw back $700 million in investments allegedly made with misappropriated FTX funds. In this court filing, lawyers for FTX's new management argued that the money promised to, quote, super networker Michael Kives, who's also a former Hollywood agent, shows SBF's disregard for formalities and spending money from companies he treated as a slush fund. We reached out to K5 for comment, and a spokesperson said that the investment firm was under the impression that SBF was completely legitimate and that they were entering into a fair, long-term, and mutually beneficial business relationship. SBF has pleaded not guilty to charges alleging that he defrauded FTX customers. Finally, JP Morgan confirmed to us that the financial institution is expanding its blockchain-based payment rail to include euro payment transactions. The system allows JP Morgan's institutional clients to make wholesale payments between accounts globally using the technology as rails. JPM Coin went live with euro payments on Wednesday. A spokesperson for the bank confirmed that since its inception in 2019, more than $300 billion in transactions have been processed using the payment rail. All right, on to our main story. Coindesk released a comprehensive report outlining obstacles facing the crypto industry this month. It's based on conversations at one of the largest crypto conferences in the world, its own Consensus 2023. Michael Casey, who was involved in producing the report, spoke with Crypto World's Talia Kaplan to break down the findings. You are one of the drivers behind the first ever Consensus at Consensus report. It's an 83-page report, and it covers some of the most pressing challenges in crypto, including regulation and privacy. And we're going to talk more about those topics in a second. But first, I want to point out that the report is based on data compiled during the Consensus Crypto Conference that was back in April. And I want to start off by asking you about the data gathering process. What exactly did it entail? I understand conversations were involved in that process. Yeah, I'm glad you're asking about the data gathering because it's actually one of the most important elements of what we're doing here. So Coindesk puts on a conference every year. It's called Consensus. We think of it as the gathering of the tribes. It's this sort of big tent event of the crypto calendar, bringing everybody from a whole host of different protocols. It brings developers and investors and regulators and you know a full rainbow, if you like, of different stakeholders in this particular industry. And okay, what do we want to do out of that? Well, we thought, look, there's these huge pressing issues that constantly are there, unresolved within the space. Some of them deal with regulation. Some of them do with how to scale the technology. Some of them deal with like, what is the optimal use of custodial wallets and privacy in these big questions. And they, they constantly have sort of different interests and different challenges coming up against them. So we thought, well, we want to put people in a room who have these different perspectives and, and like have them duke it out, if you like, and try to figure out uh, what a, a convenient path forward might be. What are the problems to be solved? What are the kind of solutions that are out there? You know, and what compromises might be made? Because if you're talking about things like how do you reconcile you know, law enforcement's demand for you know, preventing criminality and protecting the financial system from bad actors against the very important need for privacy in this space, um, 
you know, where is the middle ground? Are there solutions that can keep both sides happy? So those are the, that's the concept we were coming up with through each of these 11 topics we went with. Let's put, let's put people together and see if we can talk through these, uh, these issues, leveraging, if you like, the unique status that consensus is. And that's why we're calling it the consensus at consensus report. I want to point out, I actually was at Consensus myself, and you're spot on. Certainly, there were people from all walks of the industry, including uh, government officials, regulators, lawmakers, uh, executives, you name it. But I'm wondering, when you were, in fact, gathering information at the conference, what jumped out most to you, and why did you feel it's important to put it in the report? Yeah, look, I think, because you know, part of the gathering process as well, I should add, um, involved us polling the audience, right? We we really needed to get the input from for everybody, not just these people participating in these events who were sort of selected, but also the broader the broader group. And, you know, we did some surveys and some polls and it was the thing that of course was just most striking was just how urgent people felt the need for some sort of regulatory solution was. Um, you know, this was coming uh, as the, you know, let's call it the crackdown, the US crackdown on crypto um, was really starting to take shape. Um, it, it preceded the the lawsuits that have really attracted everybody's attention these past couple of weeks, but it certainly was already a very hot topic. Um, and we found that you know people really saw this as a challenge for the United States. That that you know the question of whether or not the U.S. can or should lead uh, crypto um, regulation and and therefore ultimately development of crypto itself um, was up for grabs. That, um, that 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 it was you know vital that this be resolved, otherwise companies could be sort of leaving the United States and going elsewhere, um, and that um, you know the the uncertainty around it was was causing you know a significant amount of angst and um, and holding things back essentially. I want to take a step back, if you don't mind. Chapter one is titled "Crypto's Image Problem," essentially acknowledging that the industry's reputation took a hit following last year's scandals. Now, the report notes that one way to overcome this, quote, image problem is through transparency. Specifically, the report says crypto projects should plainly state how their products are useful. What are some of the other ways crypto can move past this? At the end of the day, people feel like it's education. It is uh, being clear about use cases. Don't worry. Don't get hung up on, on you know, images and, and words necessarily, but try to, like, deliver very clear articulations about why um, this industry is important. And in doing so, you know, getting away from, I suppose, the the idea that it's about speculation, that this is really not about token casinos and the price going up, but like bringing home the story that there are sort of fundamental, you know, uses and values in creating these decentralized networks. The report notes that the crypto industry as a whole has responded poorly to the regulatory shift toward aggressive enforcement. There was an interesting survey in your report, actually, which showed that 45% of respondents thought the U.S. approach to regulating crypto is driving innovation offshore. Meanwhile, only 13% thought the approach was actually working to crack down on bad actors. So based on the research and conversations at consensus, what would you say are the solutions there? I mean, really, in many respects, it's just a lack of clarity. Like people critique uh, the SEC for you know conducting regulation through enforcement, um, you know, which which isn't which is a piecemeal approach. They would say to establishing what the ground rules are. The SEC, of course, comes back and says the rules are very clear. We have the Howey test. It's some things are a security, others not. Most tokens are securities in the eyes of Gary Gensler, et cetera, et cetera. But I think. From the industry's perspective, and to be fair, a lot of those respondents are literally, you know, crypto participants. Um, they see no clarity. They 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 look for legislation. They look for some of the things that's happened in these other jurisdictions, which have made much clearer definitions about what is a digital asset. You know, what constitutes, uh, you know, a sufficient level of decentralization, for example. Um, you know, and and really how it should be regulated with regards to consumer interests um, and investor interests and so forth. That there's a real sense that the United States, which has had you know, a number of efforts to put forward comprehensive legislation in this, but hasn't succeeded in any of them, is really still just very vague in terms of what the law is. 
So, you know, it's, it's that lack of clarity that I think is making people feel like, all right, I'm out of here. And, and you, you know, as, as well, I would argue, uh, clearly some of the sort of tougher enforcement actions that have been taken, but there's no doubt that you're, you're seeing significant number of quite large and significant crypto companies, um, at least think and talk, if not act upon the idea of, of, you know, shifting their operations overseas as a result of this. And certainly Coinbase is one example of that. But I want to end off by asking you about some recent developments in crypto. BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world, filed for a spot Bitcoin ETF signaling that it sees a place for the cryptocurrency in an in investment portfolio. The move opened the door for other institutions like Wisdom Tree and Invesco to follow. And this week, the crypto exchange backed by Charles Schwab, Fidelity and Citadel officially launched trading in four crypto assets, including Bitcoin and Ether. All of this is happening as the SEC continues its crackdown on the industry. So what do you think these moves by major financial institutions signify, especially amid that backdrop? And I think that's probably one of the reasons why you've seen a phenomenal rally in the price of Bitcoin uh, these last few days is that, you know, yeah, would BlackRock do this without some sort of confidence that they're actually going to get it through this time? Which begs the question, how on earth can they be so confident when the SEC is being so so hardline? And there's a couple of ways to look at this. One is that it seems pretty clear whether they like it or not that the SEC cannot treat Bitcoin as a security. It is it's got the green light that that's already been it's already been you know, treated as a commodity through by the CFTC. And there's just this is a horse that has already bolted. There's no way they can wrap this thing up and go after any players involved in it. So you know. There is some sense, if you like, that the way that this has been handled is an indirect way of saying Bitcoin's fine, and therefore let's 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 lodge this ETF. Um, I think the other one, though, is that you know there is the SEC's take here is not cut and dry. The SEC is not a monolith here, right? You've got clearly the House, the Republicans in the House, taking a very very different position on their view on crypto, and you've got you know all these other sort of forces at work that, um, you know, could really challenge uh, this, this, this position that, that the SEC has taken, this hardline position. So in the light of that, I see all of this as part of the big kind of big battle. Okay, that's all for Crypto World this week, but we'll be back again on Monday. So we'll see you then.